Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world, and welcome back to the OMG MotoGP podcast. You can get in touch as always. We're at OMG MotoGP on social media, or you can email email us a question, query, comment. Uh, the address is OMG MotoGP at gmail.com. On the show today, the title fight is still on, and you really can't call it at this stage, and we are running out of time before this season is done and dusted. Uh, Aprilia getting a little bit heated out in Thailand. We've got some Moto2 and Moto3 action and everything in between as we look back at Thailand with myself, Harry Benjamin, and as always, former Grand Prix rider and British champion, Keith Hewin. And Keith, I know you're a big fan of Thailand anyway. We all know that. Was it the best race of the year so far? Certainly had elements, didn't it? I mean, I'm fresh from the smell of two strokes moke up my nose from the National Motorcycle Museum. Um, A couple of days ago, we went up there and we had a a good time there. The sun is on. This is not a rosy glow that I've got on here. This is not makeup. This is the sun coming in through my side window. And I'm in Northamptonshire of all places. So what better mood could I be in than this, really? I'm coming straight off the back of a fantastic Grand Prix. Obviously, wish I was there. um, But needs and the like meant that I stayed in the UK. Um, I think what it's done this weekend is just shown that Whatever the mistakes that have been made by Jorge Martin, he is a contender for this championship. Six races effectively left, um, three of them at half price, and the two main ones that you can get 25 points for, obviously. Um, So we're in a situation where Bagnaia, great ride this weekend. Lucky that Binder touched the green paintwork and lost second place. Bagnaia picked up the extra points that you get for that second place. But no one was going to mess with Jorge Martin. He got it covered from the get-go, from lights out. He had it completely covered. Bike looked good. He looked good. And you know what was really impressive was the the lack of mistakes under that kind of pressure. You know, to challenge, we would always have said Magnaia on the factory Ducati would have been a bit of a, you know, bit of a handful in the braking area. But did you see at any point, if anybody gained an inch on Jorge Martin in a braking area, they ended up running on. They just couldn't get it stopped to bring it back down to the line. And I just think that Hoi Martin, that was a that was a champion's ride in uh, in Thailand. And under the, the heat, the atmosphere, okay, it was, what was it? Let me just check that very quickly. 40 degrees of track temperature, which was actually pretty cool on the day. Um, just 31 degrees of air temperature. Very, quite humid, obviously, so not easy conditions. A fantastic red hot, full up grandstands, of course. Thanks to Somkhet Chantra, of course, in Moho 2. We'll get to that in a bit. But the atmosphere in Thailand is always something a little bit special. It's a right from the, the national anthem. I've got to say, I know the Thai national anthem off by heart because I'd expect they, nothing less. They still sing it. When you go into a cinema, you will not remember this, but if you speak to your parents or your grandparents, even, then when they used to play the national anthem in the, the cinemas here or wherever there was a public event, you would have the national anthem before. Well, they still play the national anthem in the morning and in the evening across all radio stations and television stations. And so the national anthem, is it means a lot to the Thai. It's a huge amount. Um, and you can be in all sorts of trouble if you are disrespectful in any way towards, obviously, you know, Buddha refugees and the like or, or the national anthem or the king or the royal family. You know, maybe 40 or 50 years ago, we were like it here in the UK, but we're not anymore. Um, but the point being is, is the guy that sang it, I'll, I'll call him Mr. Unpronounceable because even though I know Ty quite well, I couldn't pronounce his name, not in one it, so I won't bother with that. But he sang it, young fella, and he sang it perfectly, so sharp, right at the beginning of it. You know, that place was was it, 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 in ructions there because they love that kind of thing. And then we've got racing of that kind of quality throughout the weekend. The Motor 3 race was on fire. The Motor 2 race was a little bit dull. But they'll stand that because I'm not doing a spoiler here. Everyone should have read it already. Somkia ended up in third place, comes through to pinch that third place at a podium for the local man. The other two tie runners that were in uh, Moto3, I think it was, that they, they they unfortunately fell by the wayside, but they weren't there anyway at any time. All eyes are on Somkia. So for him to not do what he did last year, pole position, then throw it away in the race, was something a little bit special. He just It's a special kind of place, Thailand in general. I mean, I'm not just saying that because obviously close to, to our heart family-wise, but um, and with some of the, I think at this stage of the year, that kind of atmosphere, you raise your game. And to see such perfection from Jorge Martin was just beautiful to watch. 
Well, I think it was Jorge said, you know, I'm, I am starting to feel the pressure a little bit. And we were all worried. Well, I certainly was worried over the last couple of Grand Prix where he has. You thought, oh, is this the Jorge of old again? A crash. He's he's lost it on its own while he's up in the lead. But the, the last five laps, the final lap, he was elbows out and not having any of it to the line. And what's the points gap now? It's 13 points, isn't it, between Martin and Bagnaia. Do you think, have you seen... A, a development from Jorge Martin this year? Yes. Has he matured as a rider? 100%. 100%. Seen a development for him. And he's in the right team. Pramac is a lovely team. You won't hear anybody not say that across the media. or whatever. They're the most helpful people there can be. They're the easiest team to get along with for, for a factory uh, inspired, a factory backed team. Really easy people. You know, it's a, it's a, I think that, you know, You'd got several things going on in in Thailand. Alex Marquez was there. Took a bit of a gamble on a medium tire on the rear, but you know, even his brother Mark, I think, had wished that he'd run a medium in the end. And um, as well, it probably was a tire that was going to going to work. But you know, you, you, you're seeing people making those kind of steps at the moment. But I think for for me, Jorge Martin's perfection was the thing. I mean, there was one penultimate lap. You mentioned right to the line. Well, the penultimate lap was something down into that final turn, which is a really tricky 90-degree right-hander that, that you, know, you can do a banzai. And because, because the finish line is so close to the exit of the final corner, it doesn't matter if you scrabble it all around there and it's as messy and as un, un, unhelpful and un, untidy as you like, you, could go, you can squirt it to the line and get away with it. That's in Moto3, Moto2 and in MotoGP. So um, it's kind of one of those unique corners where you can do a banzai and have everybody out wide. And of course, Binder, I'd got Binder down for a double this weekend, sprint and uh, main race. And I wasn't that far out in in guessing, of course, because you can only guess in this stuff. There's no education to me. Um, I thought Binder and the KTM would go well at Thailand. Um, and sure enough, he was there or thereabouts. A little bit off maybe on the sprint on, on Saturday, but on Sunday, he was on for the race win. And it just a little bit of a mistake cost him that second place as he touched the green on the on the on the final lap. But the Bagnaya passed down the outside. <laughs> and trying to to outbreak on the outside the likes of Jorge Martin and obviously Brad Binder as well. Um, yeah, it even meant that that Jorge Martin just had to run on a little bit further, which because Bagnaia was on the outside of the the final corner on the penultimate lap with just one lap and a bit to go, it just ran Bagnaia out and he lost that that second place as well as the first place. Although he got it back in the end by default because Binder obviously touched the line on the final lap. Um, on Binder, I mean, I mean, brilliant to see him involved in that scrap. But when you look at where the other KTM's finished as well, what do you think is the reason for this discrepancy that has developed? And I'm going to tee this up by giving you a theory that Clive ha- has thought of. He's got in touch and said he has a theory in the differences between the rider performances on the same KTM bike, he reckons Brad's body position and body weight distribution on the bike looks as close to being static and not moving as you can get. And any body movement he does isn't as aggressive. So the bike remains more stable. Look at Danny Pedrosa, their test rider. He's small, light. So when he's testing, the movement on the bike is minimal compared to Jack, Paul and Augusto, which Clive thinks... Well, they have a lot more aggressive movement on the bike. What do you make of that? And he's on, he's on the money to an extent. I mean, like I think Mark Marcus has touched on it this week. Did I see a quote in GP, on GP1's website? I think where, you know, I don't know whether they pinched it from somebody else, but I'll mention GP1 just out of courtesy to somebody else because that's where I read it, um, was that the Mark had said that, you know, you've got to look, you know, the KTM looks like he's making a step, but at the end of the day, there's only one rider that's really consistently doing it on it. Uh, and so your man's comments probably aren't that far away from it. I mean, think of Honda and Mark Marquez. He was the only man with his radical style that could make that work as well. So, uh, yes, it, it obviously things are aligning a little bit for the likes of Brad Binder, um, and he's making it work for him. Jack's going the other way. Though. Jack was so tense on the line, you know, in interviews that he did pre-race, I remember thinking, Christ, he's not in the right, right frame of mind for this. He's not the happy-go-lucky Jack. He's Jack under a lot of pressure, Jack. Um, and that's not so good. I think Binder, you only had to look at Binder and Jorge Martins, completely different. The, the Thai racetrack, Chang International, is, is quite a simple racetrack. There's not much to it. It's quite a simple racetrack. So you can concentrate really on what's best for you. You're, you're, it's not that technical. It's not 
you know, you, you're kind of working out exactly what works for you and for your bike. And you only got to look at the, the KTM versus the, the Ducati of, of Martin. Completely different lines in so many different places. The lap was working for them. Warm up, everybody was in within 0.9 of a second. Earlier on in, in the weekend, less than a second covered the entire 21 bike field. We're still missing Alex Rins for those of you that were, were not paying attention at the weekend. Um, you know, so 21 bikes effectively under a second in MotoGP with all those different co configurations, all those different, you know, software adjustments, you know, chassis adjustments. It's, it's, it, it's remarkable. I've said all along, I always remember when I was still in television before, um, before I, I stopped traveling the world. It's making me a bit sad when I see things like this and I'm not on an airplane. But anyway, <laughs> I always used to say to him, can't we do a feature? where we line up the 21 bikes or 21 bikes, doesn't have to be the 21 bikes, it can be any 21 bikes, and put them where they would be at the finish line with a second covering them, as, and a simulation, if you like, of what it would look like if we had 21 bikes spread out on the, on the track. It'd only be about 20 foot in it. Yeah, <laughs> or, that'd or be something. mega. It, it, and it would, it would, I just fancied like having a visual of what that, look, that would look like um, if you could put them all together on the same track doing that those times within a second of each other. I mean, I think it's remarkable, and I think we are in such a good place regarding the rules, which kind of, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put an article, I'll give it to you in a minute, Harry, an article that I read this week. Um, actually, it was sent to me by, I, I won't say who, because it, it always seems like someone's stirring the pot. So I won't say who sent me it, but somebody obviously with a great interest within our sport across all disciplines of our sport sent me this article that was written by a guy and we'll put the the link in the in the in the below so anybody listening to this can take a look at the link and click on it and i think it's right on the money basically what it's doing is it's it's saying daughter are in a bit of trouble here um you know they're, they're not not really making the most of moto gp in the way that they probably should be in the way of money new audience and so on and so forth there's a there's that that rising thing that they're setting themselves up for selling MotoGP on at some later stage as well. It's only one man's article. It's very well written. Really begs a few questions, I've got to say, and there's a lot in it that I agree with. But I wonder what our our, our supporters, our, our subscribers um, think of that when they, they take a look at it. It'll be very interesting because obviously we've not got a race meeting next weekend, so we've got Thursday. We can pick up on that and see what mm -hmm. people have got to say. So take a look in the in the comment sector below or wherever Harry sticks, sticks the, the links. <laughs> Good old Harry. He's our tech <laughs> wizard. He's not really. <laughs> he has a man that can. <laughs> yeah. But but I'll stick that in there. Have a read of it. We won't, won't, won't comment on it in a minute because I've kind of um, blindsided Harry. I haven't actually shown him the link either. So, um, But it's it, it compares Formula One, which I know that you'll have a lot of comment to do with that as well. It compares mm. Formula One and, and where they're at in their um, funding and their their new fans. One of the things that, that was was that's that's very interesting for me is that MotoGP, despite the fact it's incredibly spectacular and everybody across Formula One or whoever says that MotoGP probably is the premier class of anything when it comes to excitement and danger, which, are, let's face it, people tune in to watch. But somehow we're missing a trick. You know, we've got these sprint races now on a Saturday, which are great, especially for the likes of us, because I'd watch races every day of the week if, if they were on. But the fact is, you're kind of playing to the same people. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd subscribe and spend money on MotoGP all day long. And I'll watch a sprint race on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday if there is one. Um, but it's not really bringing in new fans. It's given more races and more opportunity for people that are already died in the wall, um, MotoGP fans. And I think that's where Dorna are missing a trick, in that we're not encouraging more people to either trackside or to, uh, to to tune in. And that's where the drives to survive in Formula One and whatever that debacle was that we tried to line up uh, in, in parallel with the Formula One effort uh, that bombed terribly and was a bit too Spanish-centric, if you like, um, as opposed to be worldwide like, like the Formula One thing is. Um, and we could have really, um, really stolen a march this last year with that it will have cost a lot of money to have produced something of the quality the drives to, to survive was produced as. You've got to put really good people on it. But if you could have, I don't know about anybody who's ever watched the Senna mu uh, movie, um, 
I know you will have. There's no good bloody nodding to me. He's preaching to the converted. <laughs> but any bike fan that hasn't watched Senna uh, as a movie, which is, a, is an incredible movie, hugely moving, but it's all done with first-person commentary as it happened. There's very... I don't think there's any overdubbing of, of added bits and pieces. It's all actual stuff as it happened, edited together in such a way that you just you just dragged along with it. And I just think that with motorbike racing being as exciting as it is, the other factor, I know I'm rambling, but you know I like to, and there's only me and you today, Harry. The other I've factor, got, I've got a is, point in a minute though. Well, the other factor is is that we lost Rossi, and with Mark Marquez being out of the equation a little bit, who would have been the natural successor up to a point that will get me slapped if I say he was Valentino's successor he's not obviously from a personality point of view Valentino had it covered worldwide across all marketplaces Mark perhaps doesn't yet even though he's brilliant on a motorbike and probably as much of a goat as as Valentino ever was on a, on a bike um, but the point being is that he does he doesn't really bring in those kind of numbers that Valentino if you put Valentino's every magazine anywhere including omg i bet <laughs> i'm guessing now somebody somewhere that's going to write our byline and our, our headline will have a rossi type thing in it or a picture of rossi because as soon as anybody looks at that everybody clicks on it everybody will come to omg motor gp because there's something said about rossi or there's a rossi picture every magazine every every person to do with anything in television or otherwise looks to find a rossi angle you know it's diminishing because obviously he's not having anything to do with much nowadays although his boys are going good for his team. But they can't find that that uh, traction anymore that they could. There is no superstar at this moment in time in MoGP, and I think Dorna are suffering from that as well. So I agree. despite the fact that series is, is in rude health, it really is brilliant, MoGP. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. It's never been as good, in my view, on tracks. Never been as good. Down, across the field, I've been in this game since bloody you know, black and white. But it's, it's kind of one of them situations where we're still not really making it work. MotoGP trounces Formula One 10 times over right. when it comes to racing on track. Oh, like this so far this season, it absolutely has to. Yeah, there's a couple of duds every now and then, but you're going to get that in racing anyway. But a couple of points then. So drive to survive the Formula One. Absolutely. MotoGP needs that not only to become more mainstream, it needs to be done like Drive to Survive to that standard, but it needs to become more mainstream. And that's how you get those that increased audience, those new viewers coming across to motorbike racing and seeing what it's all about. But also in the search for the next personalities, that's how new personalities are made. You know, Daniel Ricciardo in Formula One, even somebody like Yuki Tsunoda, who no one would know, suddenly he's a massive uh, personality because he's come across so well and he's funny and he's young all because of this Netflix documentary there's a whole legion of fans that haven't really heard of Formula 1 but know that the young Japanese driver is absolutely hilarious and swears all the time on the radio and it nails it in his marketplaces his marketplace is going to be a given and then he's gaining you know Haga Noriyuki Haga is a good example from the from the bike perspective world superbikes going back in the day Noriyuki Haga, just opening his mouth made you laugh and want to know the guy. You know, his, his, his English wasn't great. I always remember, and excuse me, this is going to be explicit, I'm going to swear. Um, when he ran into one of our cameras when we were working, we, I think it was Sky back in the day, and he ran in, and it was Donington Park, and he ran in, and he was soaked all the way through, and he just stuck his head in front of the camera and said, it fucking laning. <laughs> and it was, it's a stereotype, of course it is. But at the end of the day, it was bloody funny. And it was live, live television. So you could imagine the, you know, everybody, oh boy, sincerely apologise for somebody swearing, you know. Of course. Like, like we have to do, because that's the way it is. Um, although, although less so back then, I've got to say. God, I hate politically correct. We know, we know, we know. My 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 final point just on on, on this and, and the whole is Dorna in trouble thing, I, I think they do need to seriously look at getting a, a dry survivor up off the ground. But to come back to the sprint idea as well, I enjoy I enjoy watching the sprint racing in MotoGP like you, but I think through a, a new sort of docu-series or whatever marketing scheme it might be, 
you might well have a whole new legion of fans that only dip in for the sprint races and go, oh yeah, and no, I love MotoGP, but I just like, I, I, I can only watch it on the Saturday. I just love watching the sprint. It's all over in about half an hour. It's great. But that doesn't matter because then you, you've at least got eyes on, on a Saturday of all, of all things. And the good thing about MotoGP sprints compared against, sorry, I know people hate it when we do all the comparisons, but it's logical with Formula One, We've had sprint races this year and they're going to continue for the, they're here to stay. But more often than not, they're just a, a, a foreshadow of what's to come for the Grand Prix. There's no, there's no major point of difference. You know, Verstappen's going to come through the field if he's not already qualified on the front row. So, whereas that's where MotoGP becomes more interesting is because it's not always uh, and never is an out and out black and white. Jorge Martin's going to win ahead of Pekka Bernard. No, it's absolutely not. You have literally no idea. So that's where most GP scores points and can do well out of a sprint race. But it all comes back to the fact they need to market themselves better to Formula One standards and, and into the mainstream. I don't know whether this Dan Rosamundo guy, I know he's only joined this year, but maybe that's his that's his job, isn't it? That's his goal going forward. Do you know what? Now, I've seen some of this before, and I think I've touched on it on, on this podcast before. I remember when Randy Bernard came from Rodeo Bull, believe it or not. <laughs> Huge thing in the States, Rodeo Bull. And he came into, he was the main man, like the Rosamondos come to MotoGP, he was the main man to come to IndyCar. Randy Bernard, you have to look him up. You're probably too young for it. Um, but he was the guy that was going to be the superstar American guy that was going to make the big, big calls and make the big... I don't think this guy, Rosamondo, is probably going to do much different than, than where we are at the moment. I think it, it, it definitely needs a bit of a rethink. We've got new rules that are coming up. Everybody's talking about in 2027. Um, funding is is always going to be an issue, is going to be a problem. I don't think we've got the balance quite right on the track regarding, you know, manufacturer. I think, you know, certainly we need Yamaha. We need a couple more Yamahas if they're staying in it. Um, you know, KTM. Definitely could do with a couple more out there, if, if you like, as well, to balance it up a bit. But but these are all picking around the edges a bit. I'd hate to see gimmicks. I don't. I mean, some people thought that the sprint race was a gimmick, and I have to say that I, I had some reservation when when it was first announced that we were going sprint racing on a Saturday. Mm. But I love it. Yeah, you know, I, I, from day one, I loved it. Um, it's how we attract more. A different audience as well and bear it in mind that you can't alienate the audience that we've got you know you silverstone yeah you know, bloody hell formula one people sit in a grandstand all day long they just sit there all day long bike people aren't like that the reason silverstone isn't successful for bike people is because they've not got what they want when they're there they want to be able to walk around they want to be able to get to the front. You know, grandstands at Silverstone are right on the boundary. You can't get in front of them to, to stand there or whatever it might be. You know, everything's a mile away from the track because the track is fast. So things, therefore, are, are the barriers are like a further back. It's just, it's a different breed of person. You know, you've got to look what makes BSB so good. British Superbikes, how do they get between twenty and 30,000 people through the gate? It's great racing, but MotoGP is great racing. It comes down at the end of the day to a price point, to a situation that the fans like to be part of. You know, BSB is, is renowned around the world, and it's a domestic bloody series, for God's sake. And and to be frank, with the, you know, Jake Dixon's the only one that's doing any good that's that's moved across so far. You know, we've we've had some good riders in the UK that have come through through the domestic series, but it isn't an, a natural place to be. Look, Mackenzie at the moment, I know the team perhaps isn't the the best and so on and so forth. But this is the second time he struggled with being in Grand Prix. You know, it, it's these, the Grand Prix is the most excellent place you can possibly be from a riding perspective. But I just think, think sometimes that we're not quite getting it right. But how do you get it right? How? Yeah. that. And there is, there is, a, you know, Silverstone again, I always end up, you know, poor old Silverstone. <laughs> Here we go. Well, it, buckle in it, everyone. <laughs> it is just a shame. It is a, it's a, at the end of the day, the DNA at Silverstone is car. And it's yeah. it's not just the DNA of the track, which everybody loves racing on the track, by the way. The track itself, from a rider perspective, they'd, they'd hate to lose Silverstone um, because of the way the track is. From a, from a spectator perspective, they'd probably want to go to Donington. <laughs> Better still, Brands Hatch or Alton Park. I mean, somewhere mm. like that would be fantastic. But we're never, ever going there because they're too bloody dangerous from, from OGP protocols. They're, you know, the etiquette is just not working for them. But 
Silverstone is a car place. And sometimes you do get the feeling they pay lip service. As much as I like Stuart Pringle as managing director and the like, you know, everything that goes on at Silverstone just doesn't, it just doesn't seem to be enough effort. You know, the cart track we talked about in the past that was, that is a cart track for up and coming car drivers. And I quizzed Stuart Pringle about it last year. And he said, yeah, we ought to think about, you know, the mini motorbikes, but it's been, it's been put right on the back burner because they don't want footrest digging into the tarmac or whatever it is and, and, the, and the cost of having to, to fix the tarmac on a cart track of all bloody things. So they're not going to bring youngsters through in that particular... They're never really interested in going the extra mile to, to promote motorbike racing in the way... You know, why, do, why is it the biggest plot of land that we have for any race meeting period, apart from maybe Cota, I think that might have more land space than, than Silverstone. Um, why is the campsite in a field outside the track? Why is the campsite not inside? So all of the people that are staying there are part of the whole thing. You know, there's vast areas in Silverstone that aren't being used during during race weekend. You're trudging through it around gravel paths and all that, looking for finding another vantage point to watch what's going on. Why is the campsite not inside? I don't get it. Yeah, there, there's, it seems to me that, okay, so if you can't get everybody inside, then let's have a, 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 a you know, a, a, a slightly different style of camping or something, whatever it is, but people want to be right in the action. I mean, when you're at Brands Hatch and you go to a BSB meeting, everything to the, you know, is, is full. You know, the, every bloody place, every cubby hole is, is jammed with people or vehicles or tents. I want to see Silverstone like that. I want that atmosphere. 45,000 people. If there's only 45,000 people coming, as there was this year, um, there's room for them inside. Why are we not inside? There'll be some bloody car bloke that's that's got some, you know, prejudice against, you know, well, we can't possibly because that's where we park the BRDC cars or something along well, those yeah, lines. There, there'll uh, be someone, you know, I heard a story the other day about, you know, somebody trying to do a deal at Silverstone, but we couldn't do it because one of the BRDC members was a supplier, a preferred supplier. Smacks a bit, you know, for me, I have to say. I think Silverstone needs to look in a mirror when it comes to MotoGP. Are you serious? Are you not? Um, can I can I just interrupt here? Yeah. Because I, I think we are slightly in danger of going down a Silverstone tangent here, and we have we have done that before. That's probably true. We, Sorry. We know I, you're... I do apologise. Know... <laughs> you know Let me just apologise to everyone at Silverstone because I, 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 I feel that individually... Everybody wants it to work, but for some that's reason, why. collectively, it just doesn't. And I think that that's what needs sorting through. You know, I love the bands they have on it. it seemed, they spend the money, but for some reason, it, it, it lacks coherence for a motorcycle mm. market. I think, um, well, we, we do, we have heard rumblings that uh, this podcast is listened to within paddocks. So uh, perhaps we need a, a Stuart Pringle sit down with you, you with Keith and Stuart on the show. Maybe that's something uh, we can make happen. Or Dan Rosamundo, if you're listening, we'll love to get you on. Well, you see, Rosamundo, Dorna. I mean, Dorna, I, I think Carlos, Carlos Espeleta, I haven't spoken to him, but I, I'm likely to see him in the early part of next month. But the, mm. the, the point being, um, I think Carlos is swift on his feet, and I think the, the Spanish are across it. They 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 hear the criticism that the people give. Oh, it's a Spanish, you know, championship and all the rest of it. I don't believe that's true. Yes, of course, it's run by the Spanish and the way that they run it. But they've brought this sport to where it is, and they've funded this sport when a lot of people wouldn't have put the money in that they put in over a pandemic and the like. I think Dorna Dorna should be applauded in just about every, you know every part of the every juncture of the sports progression but i think that that sometimes you know there needs to be something different we've talked about the manufacturers having too much of a sway on the rules um and i think that needs correcting i think the the situation you know silverstone needs to be encouraged to do things slightly differently you know there there are there's there's a lot that needs fixing even though we have a brilliant sport and and that's why that's where the passion comes from, doesn't it? You just want it to be uh, the best it can be, and we all know it can be uh, bloody amazing. Let's go back to the amazing track action because um, uh, actually, well, not so much amazing. I want to talk about Aprilia um, because uh, first of all, Alicia Spargro becoming the first official victim of the tyre pressure infringement penalty. Um, but I think there were both him and Vinales and, uh, well, all those on the RSGP, uh, slightly more uh, worried about how hot they were getting on that Aprilia. 
Yeah, I think the Aprilia still is is working in a narrower window. I can't say narrower. <laughs> <laughs> it's working. It seems to be working in a narrower window than than the Ducati, particularly, um, and now the KTM. I think the KTM has a, a slightly broader window. But again, I mean Maverick Vinales, you, you looking at him over the weekend, watching what he was doing with the Aprilia, you, <clears throat> you would have expected a lot more. Alicia Spargo obviously had speed, um, but not over the entire race distance, and found themselves in a little bit of not quite able, but again, when it comes down to 21 riders being within one second, you don't have to be far off the mark to suddenly be three or four riders further back, um, and particularly over race distance. You know, and I think that they might have got, you know, you might have found that they're the, the pretty much to, to, you know, the majority of riders were on hard rear tyres where they might, some of them might have been able to, with slightly cooler track temperature on the Sunday, might have been able to get away with a medium tyre at, at the rear. Um, uh, but Again, it just seems like Aprilia, if it's not quite in the window um, on race setup, it just is a little bit more difficult to, to, to push it forward. Um, and winding back to where you were with the question earlier on about the KTM um, and, and the like, I mean, the, the KTM's working for Binder, but not particularly for everyone else at the moment in KTM or Gas Gas or whatever. Um, and that, for me, kind of concerns me slightly as well. Ducati still have the overall data performance um, correct and they're going to win the title obviously between two riders whether it's a satellite team or whether it's the the red bikes and I always think you know and I don't know whether anybody else thinks this when they're watching it I mean it, it always looks to me like Bagnaia's bike looks livelier than Jorge Martin it just looks a little bit more edgy a bit more snappy in occasions and just that comes down at the end of the day, the setup, the way that they're, they're, they're extracting the performance out of the bike. And why Martin, even though he's an extreme, you know, athlete when it comes to getting all over the motorbike, his bike just looks to be that little bit better planted and, and where he wants it to be. Um, whereas Benaya looks like he's having to ride the bloody thing hard. You know, it's, it's, it's just that little bit more, all the areas that I would have expected Benaya to have an advantage, like, in trail braking into a corner, he was always one of the, the best breakers. The Ducati worked so well on the brakes. But it just looks a little bit, you know, like he wants to turn himself inside out sometimes. And it doesn't look consistent all of the time. It looks like he's really having to use all of his exceptional skill to make the thing end up where it ends up. Um, so I think that, that, that there, there are tiny little adjustments to be made still. And maybe it comes down to the fact that, you know, we're so restricted on track time, really, that that... You can never get to that race setup type situation. You're always, and we've seen Magnaia, you know, there's a reason why he's qualified sometimes where he's qualified quite badly through qualifying one. He's had to go through Q1. And that's because he's been spending time on race setup earlier in the weekend when really you need to be getting some fast laps in. Um, so it's become really difficult, I think, for, you know, David David Tardotti looks, you know, that little bit, you know, team, team you know, chief if you like below Giabatti and, and David Delopsi team manager just looks that little bit more tense at the moment you know Gigi Delinio hasn't quite got that confident beard swipe anymore it's more of a it's more of a sort of an aggressive beard swipe <laughs> um, th these little nuances you spot in people's faces back in the garage um, make a difference I think everyone's under a lot of pressure they'll be really happy to have a week off you know this this last few weeks have been massive pressure Huge traveling, difficult conditions. Um, now we've got Sepang, you know, which is going to be great. I love Sepang. Um, Qatar, the funny time of the year under the lights, which is a, a pretty unique racetrack under lights as well. And it's all changed at Qatar. Everything, the surface is different. All the pits, everything you ever knew is all different because of Formula One. Formula One have had it all changed. That's why we are late in the season with Qatar. And then you've got an absolutely guaranteed freezing cold Valencia at the end of November. Nightmare. Yeah, we like, all know you honestly, love Valencia. Oh, <laughs> but I cannot fathom. I understand why people say we should drop Aragon off the off the, the list of Grand Prix. But Aragon as a racetrack is a billion times better than Valencia. It's just in the middle of nowhere. That's the sad part of it. And commercially, yeah, it obviously makes money, but you know, not enough. Whereas Valencia can be filled out. It's the final one of the year. Yeah, I'd rather finish at Catalonia. Let's finish in Barcelona. You know, that'd be a better track all round. You know, you can have at least you can have a real shindig as well. Being just outside Barcelona, my Valencia's okay, but 
Why do we go there this time of the year? It's going to be cold. Uh, they have a they have a test there as well, don't they? The well, they do. And I'm, oh, thank God you mentioned that because that's the big thing at the moment, isn't it? I mean, Honda have given Mark Marquez, and I think this shows the quality of the relationship between Honda and Mark Marquez. They could have easily have said no. Was it Rossi who was um, vetoed from um, testing? Uh, I think it was Rossi who was vetoed by Honda from testing uh, at the end of the season. Yamaha, Yamaha have just vetoed Top Rack Razgalioglu from testing the BMW after the final um, World Superbike round. Now, why they would do that, I don't know. It, it, I, you know, I think Keenan Sofwoglu, uh, Top Rack's manager, is not an easy guy. Um, so maybe he's pissed off Yamaha enough for Yamaha to say, "No, nah, you can work your." You know, tenancy out until the end of the year and um, then you can go and play on the BMW and you'll be on the back foot next year because you've not had the test. This test in Valencia, in the freezing cold, even though I've already just poo-pooed the state of Valencia, we're going to have a test afterwards and Mark Marquez is going to be on the Grassini Ducati alongside his brother. Um, it's an important test because it's a shakedown. You know, even if it is cold, he's still going to glean information one of the reasons, of course, factories don't like their riders um, jumping on rivals' machinery quite quickly is because they take with them knowledge. You know, Mark Marquez is going to take Honda knowledge, for how much that's worth, <laughs> at Ducati. Um, and that's probably another reason why they've just let him go because there's, yeah. there's nothing really he's going to be giving them that's, uh, that's that important apart from himself. Um, but in Top Rack's case, you know, will does Top Rack have any kind of something special that he knows about Yamaha that he can take to BMW, who are an ascending manufacturer? They they kind of they've plateaued. You know, BMW have not been that great, but they've looked pretty good this year. And with the Top Rack Razgadioglu um, factor, um, BMW could be a force in World Superbikes in 2024. So maybe that's why Yamaha vetoed it. It's been done before, but I think it's a mark of respect that Honda have for Mark and Mark has for Honda and and the like that um, they've allowed him to test a Ducati. And also it means he can bring back all the Ducati information when he inevitably goes back to Honda in, what, two, three years? <laughs> well, I, uh, unfortunately, I, I, I don't know whether he'll ever... I don't think he'll have a um, career that lasts another two or three years. What are we going to talk about next year, though, when he's won everything? Well, to start with, I don't believe that that's going to be the case. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, I think I think you know, Mark Marquez is an absolute outstanding ra- motorcycle racer, but we wait to see how he can relate to the Ducati when he gets there next year. And I've asked him in so many podcasts, will he have the Mark Marquez magic? The the extra bit, Mark Marquez is an exceptional motorcycle racer, exceptional, one of the best I've ever seen on a motorbike. Um, they come in a strange order for me. Casey Stoner is the best I've ever seen on a motorbike. A lot of people are going to argue with that, but from, an, from a rider perspective, he used to do stuff that was just magnificent. Um, Valentino, obviously, back in his day. Freddie Spencer is the first alien for me. Danny Pedrosa is another, Jorge Lorenzo. But Mark Marquez is right up there with what he could do with a motorbike, how he could override the thing, crash it but not crash it. Will he have that? That extra something. He was always going to be able to ride a motorbike fast. He's going to win races. Um, Rady, rady, ra. But will he be able to to produce that same kind of magic that we've seen from a youthful Mark Marquez? From a from a, a Mark Marquez who the sweet spot for me in a sportsman in motorbike racing is between the ages of say twenty six to thirty two. That's that those those six years. I think. It's when your innate talent that you have, that incredible genetic talent that you have on a motorcycle is matched by your experience of what you're doing and you come to this wonderful zenith of, of, of achievement at that point and it's how long you can hang that out for, you know, how long you can make that last. Um, and it's going to be very, very interesting to see where the mark can make. It'll be, it'll be fantastic. I mean... Yeah, I wish the likes of Mick Doohan had done it at some stage, swapped, but he had massive injuries and he was very much a Honda man. I mean, Mick Doohan in his day was 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 an unbel- unbeatable, unbelievable man. You know, but I wish he'd done the Eddie Lawson thing, you know, where they swapped 
manufacturers. I always think that it, it kind of conjures up that that little bit of magic for fans as well. I mean, we, you know, early season next year. I mean, we, you know, we, we're going to have people going to race meetings to see Mark Marquez on a Ducati. You know, and expect this is, the gates this... and television audiences to be up at the beginning of next year because we're all going to want to see what Mark Marquez is doing. And but if we had a to bigger to conversation that was actually yep. worth its salt, that would be the job, wouldn't it? Let's follow Mark Marquez in his comeback. It'd be fantastic. That yeah, that's uh it would be perfect. Like I you know, and to come back to your point, revealing behind the curtain slightly about titles and YouTube thumbnails and all this kind of stuff, when when that Marquez is obviously is the biggest name in MotoGP, just is. But also the storylines around him this year have been the biggest hitting, not just for us. I'm pretty sure for every single publication that covers MotoGP, of course it would be. That has interest that goes beyond the the racing track and beyond those MotoGP fans. So something like this, a change in team, it's like, you know, it is like Verstappen switching teams. It would be massive all over the news. But yet you're not ingrained in it unless you are a motorbike fan and that's just the way it is at the moment and that that does need to change it's not going to be a quick change but there needs to be more moves done to to get there um but there is such an opportunity right now you know i agree by the time he starts next year we'll have missed it yeah you know i agree we we needed all this stuff that's going on now behind the scenes all the arguments and all the rest of it with honda and, and ducati behind the scenes with his dad you know, with the why, you know, we've heard about his grandfather so many times. It would be mm. fantastic to hear what granddad has to say about the whole thing. You know, all this stuff is out, is is there going on in the background, and we're missing it. You know, as fans, we're missing it. We're speculating over it, but we're missing it. The other thing as well, and, and I'm uh, this is a probably more of a UK thing, but I would say it goes worldwide as well. Free, needs to be on most GP needs to be on free to air every week. Just does, um, whether that's on mainstream or ITV4 or whatever. I think it does. That just goes well, a longer okay. way. Okay, I'll I'll agree with you. It needs to be on free to air, but it doesn't need to be the most shit edit you've ever seen in your life with rubbish dub no. commentary. I mean, and that's what we've had. I could it be like again? Sorry, F one. Um, obviously, Sky Sports have full live coverage. Channel Four have a whole uh, dedicated broadcast team, but they take highlights. It's highlights coverage. Could we not do it like that? Yeah, I mean, of course it can be done, but it needs to be done right. I, I always feel that the, the highlights packages are, are done cheapskate. They're, they're, they're cut and shut jobs. You know, if it was a car, you wouldn't buy it because it had been joined up in the middle. Uh, <laughs> it kind of like, I, I, I never I never think that we do the highlights package properly either. I mean, it, it, you know, I think that the BT used to provide, I think Gavin Emmett used to do the top and tails of it once upon a time. Gavin was very good at that kind of stuff. I mean, I don't think Gav is, is I don't think Gav is, well, maybe he's worn down by it. I think from a from a, a race commentary point of view, Gavin is brilliant on a Friday and a Saturday. Gavin, he's been in Dorna, man and boy. I mean, he's he's part of the paddock. He speaks like loads of different languages. He's a very interesting guy. He's a hard worker. But I just think we miss something on race day. I think we miss something on race day with that. And I think that likewise, when we used to have the, the highlights packages, they just never had, it was like a narration of, it was like a rally commentary where you got a narration of what was going on and a, a surmise, a, a summary of what was going on. And it wasn't it wasn't an off-the-wall jump. I, I'm, I'm probably saying it because that's how I like to do it. I like to scream, mm. shout, jump out, ch- chuck my table on the floor, all my papers in the air, and, and, you know, go. I mean, the amount of times my family come in here when I'm watching stuff. Yesterday when bloody, uh, who was it? I can't remember now. Moto three got it absolutely sideways where it snapped sideways on him. Uh, the uh, young fella, anyway. I'll, I'll get there in a minute. I'll Furusato maybe. I can't remember. But it, yeah, on a Moto three bike. Well, I was stuck to the ceiling in here, and my family came down. I thought, oh, well, is he dead yet? Have we got rid of him yet? You know, can we claim the insurance? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, yeah, we're gonna get down a rabbit hole again. There's a good segue. You mentioned Moto three because let's end, shall we, with a bit of Moto two, Moto three action. Uh, let's start with Moto two. Um, Thamin Aldeguer took charge in the Moto2 uh, while behind Tommy, Tony, Toby, Tony Arbolino uh, did enough just to prevent Pedro Acosta being crowned. This was the first uh, opportunity he had to take the title, did not take it. Uh, as you mentioned at the start of the show, home podium for Chantra uh, and a bit of injury worry for Jake Dixon uh, for good measure in Moto2. 
Yeah, it was a pretty boring race. There's no doubt about that, which is an unfortunate. It was a nice segue between the Moto 3, which was outstanding. We'll get on that in a minute. And, and obviously Moto GP, which was like bloody breathtaking. Um, 22 laps. Um, I mean, he was irresistible, Aldegrea. Aldi there, no, there was no way that anybody was going to get near him. He got it covered right from the beginning. Let's talk Brits, shall we? Jake Dixon. Um, I haven't spoken to Jake. I wish I could have done, but obviously time zones being time zones. Um, he came rushing in and ended up ramming the the, the, the the rear end of the bike in front. And it looked like the bike in front had checked up and uh, the Jake had come rushing in. I mean, it caught him by surprise. But the closing speed was such that you got to say that there must have been something that uh, was going on in front of him. And I couldn't really work out. He didn't look like he'd come in too hot. He looked like he was going to get it stopped. But in the end, down he went, which was just not what Jake needs at this particular point. He needed to consolidate that place in the championship as well at the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, as it as it turned out, he didn't. You know, it didn't cost him too badly at the end of the day. Where is he now? Dixon still third. He needs to. He needs to finish third. But he's he's three points. Is he three points? No. Yeah, he is well, three, three points ahead of Aaron Canet as well. Yeah. So, but Jake Dixon needs these last three three rounds to go right. He needs to finish in the top three um, in the championship if he can. Uh, Rory Skinner, he's still on a he's learning 13. curve, Skinner, at the end of the day. I mean, like, you know, we, we didn't mention him last time, and I got a load of flack off of people for not mentioning Rory Skinner. Rory Skinner is a great little rider. He's been done down in the past, and, and he's had to work the hard way, Skinner has. Um, but he, he's not done and dusted yet. I mean, he's, he's, he's learning still. Places like Thailand, with those kind of conditions, are really, really difficult. You know, it's, it's something that you, you, you just have to take the experience on the nose and, um, and get on with it. Um, the uh, what your, was your yeah, and he's going, got dis- way, he had Keith. a dislocated shoulder already, Dixie, as well. I've forgotten about that yeah. from Australia. Um, so that that I mean, to, to be on the kind of form he was in the kind of pain he was in the kind of heat he was racing in, um, he was doing good, Dixon. Just a shame it yeah. ended the way it did. Yeah, he hit his uh, good shoulder, I think he said. Yeah, uh, but you uh, you got your you got your eyes are going, Keith. It's it's thirteen points. He's got the gap. Oh right, sorry. Yeah, it, my so. it's funny. I've, I've scribbled <laughs> it down. It's my writing, not my eyes. Yeah, oh, okay, well, <laughs> but but it, I mean, it's still not. It's still a small buffer, isn't it? It's the same as between Martin and uh, Pekka Banyai. Yeah, but it's Vietti. Um, Vietti is the one who he hit up the backside. I've just been out to yeah. decipher my writing from that as well. Mm. And Celestino crashed out a bit later on, soon after actually, all his own fault. So. Um, you know, Vietti ended up tumbling down the road as well. But, the, you know, I don't think there was much else to say about the, the Moto 2 race. I mean, Chantra came through from fifth qualifier, um, took a podium, crowd went mad, teed them up nicely for the next race, which was Moto GP. But Moto 3, oh. Moto 3, I always think Moto 3 should have a, a place all of its own because it just, it is mad. <laughs> it is just mad. 19 laps. And the track, the track temperature was at its hottest. Of the day for Moto Three, as it turns out, um, you know, forty-four degrees or something like that, and the sun was still out. It was before the clouds blew over because they were expecting thunderstorms during the course of the weekend. Um, as it happens, they never got touched by it. So, um, mm. you know, Bury Ram was lucky. Um, but the, the 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 big aggro, of course, was bloody Munoz when his bike stopped in the middle of the track and took Sasaki out. Sasaki ended up being, you know, Ortola missed him. In the gravel. Well, Ortola missed the back of him, but then, of course, the next up was Sasaki. So this has cost him dearly. No fault of his own at all. And as far as I can ascertain from from the track, no fault of Munoz either. You could see him trying to hook gears. Um, And uh, unfortunately, it took Sasaki right out of it, which has done us no good whatsoever. And Olgado got tangled up in that lot as well. Ended up, what, that he, I think he finished sixth in the end, but he was back to 23rd at one point. Um, so Olgado came back into the into the points fairly heavily, but again, it was a real problem. But the Munoz Sasaki thing was, yeah, you know, a bit of a problem. But in the end, what we got four points between Masia and Sasaki, unless I've read that wrong as well. So um, uh, I think I've got seventeen. Oh well, there you go. Oh no, four points. Four points between them as they started the race. Seventeen. Ah, uh, yeah, Sorry, yeah, you're yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and and actually, there were two newcomers on the podium, weren't there, for Moto Three? Yeah, uh, Furusato and uh, Vieja. Well, uh, Vieja was the man that did he have? He was the man that had that great big sideways on, and then managed to come through and pinch third place, wasn't he? At the end, yeah, Vieja, first time mm-hmm. ever on the podium, the Dutchman. He speaks more English than he speaks better English than I do. <laughs> I couldn't believe uh, it. That's in the not art. a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about public school 
posh boy that I'm dealing with <laughs> in the car fraternity. <laughs> okay, I'll shut up now. Uh, yeah. Where's Amy? <laughs> 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 yeah fair fair amy did uh, thank you amy again for coming on the show last week everyone loved amy uh we'll get her back on don't you know what? Amy, we'll do amy, a big christmas amy, show at the end amy's lovely and she's under a lot of pressure at the moment for one thing and another uh, you know you know family life and the like is, is is quite quite not tough but she's got a lot on her plate amy so really appreciate her when she comes in and and and, and helps us out a little bit as well and she's and she's got knowledge um but she's got, and I, ah, bloody hell, I know what it's like around here with family. You, you know, you're flat out all of the time. And to sit and watch, you know, hours and hours of, of I'd do it anyway, whatever the circumstances. Yeah, yeah. Even, even if there was a divorce involved, I'd be doing it anyway. But the point is, it takes hours and hours and hours of watching this stuff and, and making sure that you've got everything that you need to, to make the right, to, to have an opinion. First of all, you've got to have the knowledge and you've got to watch what's going on. Which is another reason why, if you if if anybody that joins in with us, if you've watched the whole racing and you you feel it like we do, and you, you you know don't miss anything, they're the ones I really love to hear the comments from, not the ones that have picked on a headline from somewhere. Um, and we still we still value you, obviously, but but sometimes you need to read a bit more into it. Sometimes when there's been a headline, you know we're guilty of it sometimes as well. I mean, like you know to put a a headline up. Here you go. Peko Bangnai is an idiot, um, which is something that, that I had actually said um, in, a, in a comment. And Peko was on like a shot onto us about it because, you know, why you call me an idiot? Because, you know, I never disrespected you, which is quite right. Um, but the point was, was that that isn't, really, that isn't really the headline. The headline was that I was defending him and saying he's going to feel like a bit of an idiot because he got done for drink driving, uh, which we obviously conveniently have heard nothing about since. Um, but I was saying he should be dealt with in the way that the law should deal with him as he would any other person, but it shouldn't affect his racing license or anything to do with the racetrack. I was supporting him. But my point is, all he saw, even a man of his experience with his PR people, only saw the headline. So it's always a good thing. When you see a headline, don't quite believe it or check out its um, context. It's very important to 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 try and... Whichever podcast you watch or whichever thing that you do, it doesn't matter if it's ours or or anybody else's, just try and try and um, get the full context of the comment that's made rather than get on that bloody great big roller coaster of uh, viral insults that come to some people that have uh, had their clickbait headline put up. Okay, so looking forward to uh, the clickbait title I can come up for this show. I can't with. wait. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the, I'm just, pretty sure you said Jorge, Jorge Martin, Martin at me. idiot. <laughs> yeah, Keith Ewan is an idiot. Done. Viral. Thank you. Uh, no, thank you uh, for everybody for uh, your support so far. There's still people finding us all the time. But I think I think we can say we are the number one MotoGP podcast now. We found ourselves in the Apple Sports charts and we were we were, ha- we were ahead of everyone else. And there's some good competition out there. So we appreciate the support as always. Uh, do continue to spread the message. Um, we're out of time for today, but we're back on Thursday for some more extra um so get in touch anything from this show that you want us to pick up on or indeed any questions in general because there's no racing this weekend and don't forget to check out that link that yes. uh, harry's going to put at the bottom here that um please read the article i mean it's a, an individual guy that obviously knows his stuff he's got a bit of opinion in there that you might not agree with but some very interesting points that i found interesting and i'd quite like to discuss that with harry on uh, on thursday so your input would be very much valued thank you very much Right, well, I've got some homework to do then. Okay, we'll see you on Thursday with Extra. Uh, and you can get in touch uh, below in the comments or at OMG Motor GP on all the socials. And the email address is omgmotogp at gmail.com. But from myself, Harry Benjamin, and from Keith Ewan, uh, we'll see you for Extra later in the week. Bye-bye.